Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is from chapter 282. Chapter 282. Meanwhile, another column was to have attacked the French from the front, but Kutusov accompanied that column. He well knew that nothing but confusion would come of this battle undertaken against his will, and as far as was in his power, held the troops back. He did not advance. He rode silently on his small gray horse, indolently answering suggestions that they should attack. The word attack is always on your tongue, but you don't see that we are unable to execute complicated maneuvers, said he to Milorodovich, who asked permission to advance. We couldn't take Murat prisoner this morning or get to the place in time, and nothing can be done now, he replied to someone else. When Kutuzov was informed that, at the French rear, where, according to the reports of the Cossacks, there had previously been nobody, there were now two battalions of Poles, he gave a sidelong glance at Ermolov, who was behind him, and to whom he had not spoken since the previous day. You see? They are asking to attack and making plans of all kinds, but as soon as one gets to business, nothing is ready, and the enemy, forewarned, takes measures accordingly. Ermolov screwed up his eyes and smiled faintly on hearing these words. He understood that for him the storm had blown over, and that Kutusov would content himself with that hint. "'He's having a little fun at my expense,' said Ermolov softly, nudging with his knee Ravsky, who was at his side. Soon after this, Ermolov moved up to Kutusov and respectfully remarked, "'It is not too late yet, Your Highness. The enemy has not gone away. If you were to order an attack,' If not, the guards will not so much as see a little smoke. Kutusov did not reply. But when they reported to him that Murat's troops were in retreat, he ordered an advance, though at every hundred paces he halted for three quarters of an hour. The whole battle consisted in what Orlov Denisov's Cossacks had done. The rest of the army merely lost some hundreds of men uselessly. In consequence of this battle, Kutusov received a diamond decoration, and Benningsen some diamonds and a hundred thousand rubles. Others also received pleasant recognitions corresponding to their various grades, and following the battle, fresh changes were made in the staff. "'That's how everything is done with us, all topsy-turvy,' said the Russian officers and generals after the Tarantino battle, letting it be understood that some fool there is doing things all wrong, but that we ourselves should not have done so.' just as people speak today. But people who talk like that either do not know what they are talking about, or deliberately deceive themselves. No battle, Terutino, Borodino, or Austerlitz, takes place as those who planned it anticipated. That is an essential condition. A countless number of free forces, for nowhere is man freer than during a battle, where it is a question of life and death, influence the course taken by the fight, and that course never can be known in advance, and never coincides with the direction of any one force. If many simultaneously and variously directed forces act on a given body, the direction of its motion cannot coincide with any one of these forces, but will always be a mean, what in mechanics is represented by the diagonal of a parallelogram of forces. If in the descriptions given by historians, especially French ones, we find their wars and battles carried out in accordance with previously formed plans, the only conclusion to be drawn is that these descriptions are false. 
The Battle of Tarutino obviously did not attain the aim Toll had in view, to lead the troops into action in the order prescribed by the dispositions, nor that which Count Orlov Denisov may have had in view, to take Murat prisoner, nor the result of immediately destroying the whole corps, which Benningsen and many others may have had in view, nor the aim of the officer who wished to go into action to distinguish himself, nor that of the Cossack who wanted more booty than he got, and so on. But if the aim of the battle was what actually resulted in what all the Russians of that day desired, to drive the French out of Russia and destroy their army, it is quite clear that the Battle of Tarutino, just because of its incongruities, was exactly what was wanted at that stage of the campaign. It would be difficult, and even impossible, to imagine any result more opportune than the actual outcome of this battle. With a minimum of effort and insignificant losses, despite the greatest confusion, the most important results of the whole campaign were attained. The transition from retreat to advance, an exposure of the weakness of the French, and the administration of that shock which Napoleon's army had only awaited to begin its flight. All right, that concludes my reading of chapter 282. I will now proceed to my reflection on the same. A Year of War and Peace, Day 282. The World Will Not Quarrel. The fancies of the poets know no bounds where the warrior is constrained on all sides. Virgil, bard of a budding empire, prophesied an imperium without end. Augustus, martial master of Roman sovereignty, on the other hand, his imagination limited by natural bulwarks and recalcitrant barbarian enthusiasms, initiated an imperial policy of non-expansion. Succeeding Caesars fought to preserve the Roman frontier rather than extend it. This wise policy, followed with few exceptions, fueled the growth of the Pax Romana. Kutusov, our august and cautious Russian general, finds himself today, as he has throughout the campaign, among a volume of Virgils. Each of them urges attack. To the extent of his power, Kutusov refuses their proposals. He does not seek to direct the battle, he seeks to be directed by it. He understands that the multivariate forces at work in the war are beyond his control, and he adopts a strategy of calm acceptance rather than brawly adventure. Tolstoy writes of his reward. With a minimal effort and insignificant losses, despite the greatest confusion, the most important results of the whole campaign were attained. The transition from retreat to advance, an exposure of the weakness of the French, and the administration of that shock which Napoleon's army had only awaited to begin its flight. Daily Meditation Therefore the wise man, embracing unity as he does, will become the world's model. Not pushing himself forward, he will become enlightened. Not asserting himself, he will become distinguished. Not boasting of himself, he will acquire merit. Not approving himself, he will endure. For as much as he will not quarrel, the world will not quarrel with him. Lao Si, Dao De Ching. All right, so that concludes my reading of and reflection on War and Peace, chapter 282. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for joining me. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you could do so either by purchasing the ebook, A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one-time donation down to PayPal. The links to all that are down below in the description. You'll also find down there a link to my Amazon uh, DVD wish list and Amazon book wish list. And if you decide to support me by purchasing one of those, we'll set up a, a Zoom talk so we could talk about uh, whatever book or movie you get from me. Uh, thanks so much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. Tomorrow we're going to be reading and reflecting on chapter 283. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and others.